I'm Fiona McDonald, and one of my roles with EONS uh, is around supporting EOTC coordinators um, in their work with schools. And I'm also, uh, one of my other roles um, outside of EONS is as a lead auditor, particularly around um, adventure activities and education outside the classroom um, in a health and safety space. Um, so I'm bringing both of those hats today uh, when I'm talking about working with external providers. Uh, we're going to be talking about the four C's today. Uh, communication, consultation, cooperation and coordination. Um, you could probably say five and put collaboration on the end of those as well. Um, but we'll work through um, what those mean um, from a school's point of view. Um, they apply and everything we talk about today applies both um, on the school site and off the school site um, with providers. Oh, sorry. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping um, bits and pieces. Um, if you stay on mute for the session and um, pop in questions in the chat works really well. Um, and then Catherine and I can run through those at the end of the session or um, just answering you or asking your questions at the end of the session. Um, when you're doing that, it's nice to have the video on as well, um, but that's completely up to you. And well, I'll try and run through um, the PowerPoint um, reasonably quickly and just adding a few examples in so we leave as much time as we need for questions at the end. Uh, a quick check, most of you will have come to this Zoom um, because your score is already um, on the National EOTC Coordinator Database. Um, but if you've come to this Zoom in a different way, um, make sure that someone on your school, the EOTC Coordinator, is registered on that database and we would really appreciate your help in getting as many schools onto that database as we can. So if you wanna check with your neighboring schools, that'd be really appreciated. Um, it's a great way to make sure that the most current good practice information is coming into your school, which is important. Um, right, some overarching messages for today. Um, all schools and external providers have responsibility under the Health and Safety Work at Work Act. Um, and one of the key ways of meeting those responsibilities is working together with the external providers that you are using. Uh, you need to understand the activities that you're going to be involved in and the level of risk that those activities involve uh, and how that will be managed. Keeping up to date, uh, being on the EOTC coordinator database, attending the PLD for education outside the classroom, are all really important ways um, of making sure you're working at current good practice. And using form six, which we'll look at towards the end of the slideshow, um, is going to be able to guide you and help you record your discussions with your external provider. So if we'll look first at the school's key responsibilities and then we'll look at the key responsibilities that providers bring into this um, joint space. So what does working together look like? Um, it looks like discussing and agreeing and documenting those discussions. Uh, so you wanna be looking at how the two organizations safety management systems will work together, how they'll be applied and where each organization has the primary responsibility. Uh, so for example, external providers will normally have the primary responsibility for running the particular activity you might be doing. Um, so for example, if it's kayaking on the pond at their site, they own the kayak kayaks, they provide the buoyancy aids, um, they assess and manage the risk levels. So they have the primary responsibility for that particular activity. Schools often 
have the primary responsibility for students during the free time or the overnight component of camps, um, if we're looking at camps. And it's really important for the two organisations, the external provider and the school, to discuss and understand how that all fits together and agree on who's got responsibility for what within that structure. Um, it's very important that you're clear on how both um, safety management systems work together. And a good way to look at that is through a lens of emergency management. So in an emergency, um, it's often the provider's system that manage the immediate situation, so the first aid, for example. But it would normally be the school system that would manage how to communicate about what's happened with parents and other staff and back at school. So it's really discussing with the provider and working out whose system does what and when it does it. And having that agreed before you actually have to try and put it into place. Um, the other thing to discuss, agree and document is the supervision structure for the event. And that includes events where providers are coming on to the school site to um, help the school. So really looking at who's doing what supervision, how school staff fit into that supervision structure for the activity, and then really teasing out the roles and responsibilities of all the staff involved. Who's really taking the lead for the behaviour management? Um, who's taking the lead for giving the instructions for the particular activity? Really discussing and making sure you're clear on whose roles and responsibilities, or where the roles and responsibilities lie for all of those things. Uh, now, there are some responsibilities that are key for the school. Um, and of course, as we would all expect, um, the first one of those is the intended learning outcomes. So what is it that you're really after um, getting out of this activity for your students? How will that experience be integrated into the learning before and after once the students are back at school if they're leaving school? Once those intended outcomes are planned, sharing those with the provider um, is a key responsibility of the school. Next responsibility is to provide competent staff. You've um, already agreed on what the supervision structure might be and the roles and responsibilities within that. Now the school needs to think about uh, the competencies that are needed to meet those responsibilities and those requirements of the particular activities and what staff have those competencies um, to meet the supervision requirements. So for example, uh, the camp might have a, a, a pool on site. If part of the supervision structure and the discussions you've had with the provider is that um, the school staff are going to supervise students in the pool, then the school would need to be thinking about uh, do we have staff that have the right competency to be able to supervise students in a pool? First aid, um, life saving qualifications, competency around water. Those are the kind of questions you would be asking yourself. Uh, another key responsibility for schools is providing quality student and staff information. So that's health, medical and behavioural information so that the provider uh, really knows and can tailor what they're doing um, and how they're working their program to meet the needs, student needs. And uh, they know another level of staff information as well. So uh, that key medical um, information for staff is important for the providers to know. Um, and then there's a range of things to discuss with the provider um, around expectations of the student behaviour, in particular around who is really going to manage that student behaviour. Um, and also what you need to do to prepare students for that experience. Uh, is it the school's responsibility to make sure they have um, the gear list that's provided or are the providers going to provide the gear they need? 
discussions and being really clear on those things. Providers' responsibilities. Uh, once the school has um, had that discussion about intended learning outcomes, the provider has a responsibility uh, to indicate how they're going to meet those and to provide the safe learning environment to enable those to happen. They too need to provide competent staff to meet that supervision structure that you've agreed on. And they also need to provide um, either details of their registration as an adventure activity operator or an overview of their safety management system. So uh, if they are providing an adventure activity and there's a, um, there's a set kind of list of what those are, then um, they will have had a, um, an audit um, and they will be on the register of adventure activity operators. So they are activities like flying foxes, abseiling, high wires, um, and also um, some higher level kind of kayaking, mountain biking, sea kayaking, rafting, those types of activities um, that are probably more likely um, in a senior outdoor education class um, than in a, a, a junior um, school camp situation. Although lots of junior camps um, have the abseiling high wires and flying fox kind of categories um, in, in them. So lots of camp providers will be on the register of adventure activity operators. Um, that means, um, if they're sitting on there, it means that their safety management systems have been audited and you can be assured that their systems meet the required safety standard. Um, some providers who don't provide adventure activities will um, choose to be audited. They won't be on the register, but they will be able to provide you an audit certificate. If they aren't on the register and they don't have an external audit, you need to do the orbit um, and ask for an overview of their safety management systems or have a discussion about what those look like. Um, that might include their safety management plans, what their staff qualifications are, an overview of kind of the training and currency that their staff go through. And, and possibly some health and safety performance records. What you're really looking to do is get a, a level of comfort that they are um, current in what they're doing and they've got good systems wrapped around um, their safety management. The provider also has um, some responsibilities around providing their um, child protection policy and assurance that all their staff are safety checked as per the Vulnerable Children's Act. Uh, and then it's all the kind of details of logistics, uh, all the things you need to know um, to uh, be prepared for the activity and know what's going on. Um, they will also have a responsibility uh, for providing personal protective equipment where that's required. Um, and so it's important to know that they're going to do that. And it's important for you to discuss with the provider the emergency procedures. And that is really around who does what, when, and making sure you're really clear on how all that communication um, works there. Uh, Few considerations for COVID. It's really going back to um, making sure you have a discussion with the provider. Uh, you're assuring yourself that the systems they have in place, um, depending on the level, uh, meet what uh, the school's requirements are. And uh, just working back and forth to make sure that you're comfortable with um, that they have the requirements for each level um, well catered for. Right, a couple, oh, sorry, I'm going to just flick over and have a look at Form 6. Okay. So Form 6 is the external provider agreement in the toolkit. Um, 
that uh, sits on the EON's website or on the Ministry of Education um, TKI site. And it can really provide you um, either with a template to use or a template to base your discussions on. Lots of providers will have their own kind of contract, um, so it's not necessary for you to use this particular um, form as a contract, but it does provide a good basis for running through what you need to discuss with them and a record of that you've had those discussions. Um, so you can see here, down here, it's got a list of school responsibilities, a list of provider responsibilities. The idea, of course, is that with all these forms that you edit them to suit your um, your school needs and the particular activity and provider you're working with. So th some things um, might not be relevant, so you just um, delete them out for that particular activity. And you can see the, there's a bunch of declarations that we make there, there um, before it gets signed off. Um, if you choose not to use it, then um, as the contract, then you can still put notes all over it and keep it as your record of the discussion that you have with them. Uh, just a couple of things from the EONS website. This is the big button on the home page to join the EOTC database. Uh, in here, under EOTC management off the home page, this is where you find the Zoom series down in here. Uh, and there's some EOTC frequently asked questions in here as well. And off the resources and publications page, on the home page, um, there's learning through COVID-19 alerts, and there's a whole bunch of information in here, including um, links to the last two presentations, which were EOTC and Outdoor Ed at level two, and EOTC at uh, alert level one. Um, so they sit in there as well, as a whole bunch of other information. Uh, the other thing I do is um, sit on the end of this email address here. Um, whenever you have any questions around EOTC, um, you can just flick those through. Um, I've been doing some little individual Zooms with people, looking at the systems, um, answering tricky level one and two questions. Um, so really, it's up to you um, what you'd like to ask. Um, with that email, but it's really there to support you with those kind of more individual questions where you're just not quite sure or um, you'd like someone to find you a little bit of guidance um, or point you in the right direction for a resource around your safety management systems. So that's the end of um, what I had to share. Um, So questions would be great now. So, uh, kia ora everyone, it's Catherine here from the EONS office. I have a question from James around PPE. Is the school responsible for a provider's PPE? James, you might even like to expand on that, depending on how Fiona answers. Uh, you have... Uh, you have some responsibility for ensuring they have, uh, they are providing PLD, uh, PLD, PPE. Um, so if um, it is an activity, because you have a responsibility for understanding the activities um, that the providers are providing to your students, um, that entails also having an understanding of where PPE um, would be appropriate. Uh, so that's part of that conversation, really. And, you know, if, if you know that um, providing kayaking, then you say, who's providing the helmets and the life jackets um, are the examples of PPE for those activities. If they're providing mountain biking, you'd want to ask them a question about, well, are you providing um, helmets? Are they all... Um, 
standard helmets and when did you last check them? Just questions to gain an understanding of their systems. If they are... I was looking for, Fiona, uh, um, I'm just worried that, say, a provider um, is providing helmets for a bike ride or something, um, we as a school have to rely on that equipment. And, and where, is there a line somewhere where, you know, we've actually got to make a decision whether to accept what they are saying? Um, now I've gone to a provider once before and asked them to provide me with a service record of a, uh, a, a bicycle, um, you know, yep. and they couldn't do that. And then I felt that it was my call whether we went with that or not. But um, they assured me that all of their equipment was serviced regularly, you know. So yeah. Um, it's a hard one for me. Yeah. To, anyway. I think that's a really good um, inquiry, James, to make. And they should be able to tell you, um, uh, they should be able to give you a service record. They should be able to assure you of the systems of checking. Uh, if they are an adventure activity operator, yeah, they, and they, have to. They, they have an audit, yeah. that is definitely part of the audit. Um, so as soon as they can give you an audit certificate or they're on the register, you know that that's been checked. But in your example, um, yeah, I think providers out there show caution to the wind. Yeah, there are a yeah. lot of providers out there that aren't necessarily adventure-based activities. Yes. Um, so they're not on that register. And then, you know, the school kind of feels responsible to make that call. And Sometimes, you know, a provider might get a little bit ropey with you if you keep coming back and saying, well, you know, what's the service record on, on your bikes, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's very fair to be asking, um, what's the service record? Do they meet um, current best practice, um, or, uh, for example, with helmets, uh, the standard, the New Zealand standard, safety standard? Mm. Um, and by asking those questions, um, you're taking, um, you're demonstrating your school's responsibility. If they're answering yes to that, and then it turns out down the track that they are not, um, they ha they aren't, the helmets aren't at that standard, then you've asked, they've said yes, they've got the primary responsibility for those helmets because they're providing them. Um, so that's where that responsibility would be more in their court at that stage. But definitely you asking the question and seeking assurance from them is a good practice. Okay. Yeah, because God forbid if something should happen and, um, you know, WorkSafe came in and did an audit of uh, an, an accident investigation or something, um, one, one would like to think that, you know, we as a school would, you know, would be able to prove that we've done enough. Yep. Um, you know, and, and sort of, I suppose, having a, 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 a tick box questionnaire or something with, with the service provider of, as to whether they've serviced their equipment. Yep. Could be okay, is that? Yep. Um, also, that could be something that you highlighted on that external provider form, that declaration. It's kind of the idea that they are declaring that that is what they have, they are providing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why you're hiring them too. That's important to keep in your mind. You're hiring them to provide that service and to provide that um, PPE. So they have the primary responsibility. Okay. Thank you. Fiona, uh, there's a question here. Um, any ideas around how to handle the collection and protection of staff medical information? This can be sensitive, but sometimes necessary to collect. Um, yes, and it's just uh, really looking at what is relevant um, for that for the provider to know about that staff member. Um, so if you kind of think of it as an emergency situation, if that staff member fell over in the field, uh, what, would, what medical information would be necessary 
or helpful for the provider to know about. And also, um, when the provider and the school are working together on the supervision plan, uh, knowing that kind of medical information can be helpful as well. So if you've got a teacher who's got allergies, for example, um, you might not put them supervising out in the orienteering grassy field, for example. Um, and it's just an understanding with the provider um, about how widely that information is shared um, and under what circumstances it's shared. Thanks, Fiona. So the next question is a COVID-related question. We have a school camp coming up next term. I'm wanting to know what recommendations you have in regard to how to best manage a child or support person should they become symptomatic. We have kept cabins spare to isolate should this eventuate. Would we as the school running the camp be responsible or should we work with our accommodation provider? Uh, work with your accommodation provider um, to see what systems they have in place because uh, they will also be thinking about exactly the same thing. And uh, I've talked with this around this with a number of schools, particularly when they're going on trips into the outdoors, but it's around um, having a system for how you would get that student back to their family who then has the responsibility um, for testing, isolating, and um, following all the health procedures that would be picked up. So it's looking at being able to, um, and having a cabin booked the way you could isolate them is a fantastic um, first step because um, you pop them in there and then what, what's your plan for getting them back to their parents um, safely and if it's your staff taking them to the parents, you know, do you have the appropriate PPE um, to enable yourself to do that or are you actually just getting the parents to come to them and um, get them and then it's off into the health system for the lot of them. And at that stage too, um, the Ministry of Health would be coming in and giving you advice on the, the rest of the protocols that would wrap around that camp and those kids. So Mitchell, if you have anything um, or any further query around that or you want to add to Fiona's comment, then um, please do feel free. No, that, that actually answered a lot of the questions. Um, we're very fortunate that we've got a principal and a board who have identified that we've got a group that's under 150 maximum. Sorry, my cat's annoying me. <laughs> um, uh, and so we're very fortunate that that's a possibility for us. Um, so now we're just trying to make it so that this isn't another thing that gets canceled this year. We will still want to have some form of outdoor education for our children. Um, yep. As everyone else will probably agree on this, it's just been a year for it, and I suppose in reality, it's probably highlighted a, um, I suppose a, a misjudgment, if you will, stuff that perhaps we haven't really thought about too deeply because it hasn't been an issue for us to concern ourselves with, yeah, up until now. So, um, and now you're going to have fantastic systems if you ever have to deal with um, vomiting. You know, norovirus, we're all going to have um, the right PPE to deal with um, those types of outbreaks at our school camps as well. Yeah, 100%. Forward, yeah. They've always been reactive remeasures, and yeah, now it's yeah, proactive thoughts. So, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Pleasure. Have we got any other questions or comments at this point? So, I've got a question if that's okay. Um, it's Paul from Queen Margaret College in Wellington. So um, I've got a question about the external providers, um, particularly those who were audited or marked. Yep. We've had a few issues with them um, because they're call marked, they don't want to talk to us about anything. They, they just want us to hand over our children and walk away, yep. which we never do. And um, they, they seem very reluctant and almost aggressive to engage with us. Um, and we've even had one recently trying to cross out parts of the document six, you talked about the external provider agreement. The bit that says um, that we want them to respect our staff's ability to step in um, if needed. 
yeah. they cross that out and um, they, they seem to think that if they're Qualmart, that's it, that we have no say. And, um, and I'm not accepting that, but I'm not quite sure exactly what the relationship is for these companies. Um, yeah. What we have the right to say and to do and what they should be doing. Yeah. Um, and you're not the first to, to bring that to the table, Paul. And it just amazes me um, because they should know that they, are, uh, um, they have responsibilities to collaborate with you under the health and safety legislation. And being audited doesn't take those responsibilities away. Um, they still need to talk to you about um, you know, the supervision structure, the roles and responsibilities, all of those things that we ran through. None of that is taken away by holding that audit. Um, all of that, the only thing the audit does is give you some assurance that their safety management systems meet a standard. Um, so what they can we reasonably expect to ask for? What, what can we expect them to pass across to us and discuss and, uh, and show us in terms of documents? Well, they still need to, um, so you've got staff going on that camp or that experience. Yeah, sometimes actually our students just go to them and they run the event. Right. And our staff aren't there. So for very small, say, Duke of Edinburgh's oh, expedition right. yep. training. Yep. Um, so they still have responsibilities to, um, to really show you how they are inducting, um, if your staff are going, your staff, um, into their workplace. Um, and, you know, it's... It amazes me that they're not willing to have a conversation around how they're managing um, the risks that your students um, are exposed to at their um, location or through their activities. Um, and you definitely um, are completely in the right about pushing back on that and wanting more of a conversation around understanding how they're managing um, your students. So what is it that we can specifically ask for and what is it that we should expect just to assume is, is already in place? Because they've had an audit, you can, uh, you can take some assurance that uh, their safety management systems are meeting the standard, but um, you can still ask for some more detail around those because um, you know they're raising a red flag when they're not willing to engage in a conversation with you absolutely thanks um, so yeah I mean I'd be asking for more from them than perhaps you would um, from someone from a provider who just said yeah was really open to a conversation about how it all worked um, all right thank you, right, thank you. yeah uh, so yeah, you you could ask for um, kind of, you know maybe an activity. You could ask for just an example of how they um, manage safety for a particular activity, just to get a, a, a flavour of what it looks like in their place. Yeah, thank you. So from Victoria here, do you have any suggestions on how to enable safe farm visits? Is there a safety action plan template for this that I could add to? <laughs> Great question, Victoria. Um, the next session um, in a month's time is on the Good Practice Guide resources. And um, those are exactly that, um, templates for particular activities. And um, we haven't got a farm visit one yet, but the next one off the cab, off the rack is um, around volunteering and that will encompass farm visits. Uh, whether there's something in there, I think if you had a look in there, there'd be um, things that would guide you um, in enabling a, a safe visit to a farm. And, um, just as camp providers uh, have responsibilities under health and safety, um, so do the farms. So again, it's just having that conversation 
about how the two organisations, the farm and the school, work together to make sure that that um, <laughs> works well. Uh, okay, next fortnight. Um, how about you flick me a little email, Victoria, and I'll send you a link or two on my EOTC support um, address. Sorry, Fiona, it's Craig Smith from Tardew High School. Can I talk to that a little bit? <laughs> Sorry, Craig, I didn't Can quite... I talk to that question a little bit? Yeah, go for it. So we use four or five different farm providers at Tardew High School. And what we've found is a lot of them, as part of their, uh, whatever it is, ministry, their business side of things, have a health safety plan in place yep. that has a, a compulsory part of how they deal with visitors or other contractors on site. Yep. And what we find with our four or five farms are actually going and looking at those visits, those, that section of the health and safety management plan covers quite a lot of the EOTC process. Yep. Good so point. Perhaps asking what is their health and safety business plan as a farm, which they should have one, and mm. seeing what it says around that might solve that problem in the short yeah. term. Yeah. And then um, it's really, it's that primary responsibility thing. So you, once you're on the farm, you're really working within, mostly working within their system. So as Craig says, it's meeting whatever their requirements for visitors are. Uh, within their health and safety management plan. Thanks, Craig. Any more questions out there? Oh, quiet. Now I should say, um, the, we aim to do these Zoom, um, EOTC Zooms, uh, every second Tuesday of the month. Um, the next one is on the Good Practice Guides, um, which is really useful resource um, for schools. Um, there's things like um, archery, um, flat water um, activities, orienteering is in there, all sorts of different things are, are covered by those resources. So that's um, the next one coming up. And the one after that is working with um, risk assessment forms. So form two in the toolkit. Um, and so we'll just work through the process um, with that form um, in that workshop. But I'm very open to other ideas um, for the because this is we plan this to be an ongoing series um, so if there's a burning issue that you think other people would be interested in um, please let me know at that email address those are really good uh, as well fiona i'm quite keen to attend those um, meetings particularly around um, uh, good practice guidelines uh, for specific events um, i'm also looking at a lot of um, yeah, I've had our uh, sports coordinator come to us and ask us for some practice guidelines and risk assessment, um, you know, uh, templates that she can actually use when it comes to organising things like tournament week, you know. Yeah. I did wonder if the, um, the third one that I haven't planned yet could be one for sports coordinators around what a EOTC system could look like for sports coordinators, so those kind of more um, getting things a bit more generic and a bit more set for like a whole season. Um, so are those dates on the um, uh, web, uh, web page or home page or for those? Yep. They are. Particularly the next two, you said both, both look very good. Yeah, so they're in um, the Zoom series Oh, okay. If we go back. Okay. So they are linked. Uh, there's, it's a page and it has actually, it's already got the registrations listed for, and open for, for those Zooms oh. under EOTC management. And then there's, we've Fiona, can you just circle that again? Yeah. yeah. The EOTC Zoom management series. Zoom series. So that's off. Um, so if you just do oh. a drop down off EOTC management on the blue top tab there, yeah. that's, um, that, that head is on every page and then down to EOTC management Zoom series and then 
the Zooms are listed there and at the bottom of the page are copies of the recordings of, of the Zooms that we have had. Fiona, we would be really keen on the sports one if you did one, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sounds like that might be my next one off the on the list. I might invite some people to come and watch. <laughs> <laughs> Great. The more the merrier. Uh, and, and there's also a question here from Craig. Are there any resources sessions available to help us deliver some EOTC PD to staff in school internally? Uh, so Catherine, you might be able to... I think first, yeah, first and foremost, um, Craig, the, the two-day PLD that we do run, the EOTC PL, uh, management PLD, um, is full of activities and, um, and, and bits and pieces that uh, are suited to taking back into your staff um, for internal PLD. And alongside of that, there are also on, um, on our website and also on TKI, I'm, I'm just looking whether we can see it on Fiona's screen here. There are online modules also that unpack aspects of, uh, of EOTC management as per the guidelines. They are um, housed. Um, online online learning modules I can see in that drop down that Fiona's got on the screen there. So under EOTC management again, about the third one from the uh, fourth one from the bottom, online learning modules. So there are there is material in there that can help uh, that can support your um, your taking aspects of um, um, of that whole space back into the staff room for PLD. Um, and at the moment, yeah, we are also at the moment just in the planning stages of packaging a little bit more support around those online learning modules by way of um, coming together as people might unpack them and, and, and running some conversations around those online modules. Oh, yeah. there they are, there, Fiona. Yeah. So here they are, here. Um, so they could be quite a good thing, Craig, to run through, um, pull up in a staff meeting and run through the aspects of those modules. Yeah, and as Catherine said, next year, looking at probably a similar kind of format as um, this series, but are based on those modules, which could be useful for schools to link into. Thank you very much. Actually, I think, and Robin, um, I, I, you don't mind my sharing this because I think it is a good, I, um, it is a good idea. Just um, it might be quite good to hear to hear other um, to, um, to hear ideas for, about what other schools are doing for for their internal PD and their wider school learning. It's possibly not for now, but I think if we were to um, there might be there might be some people in the meeting still who um, who have taken taken um, taken some some material into their staff rooms into their staff meetings hi Catherine I'm quite keen to have a look at those modules from that online learning thing but I attended the day one course yesterday with Libby in Wellington and um, um, I, I can recommend that that uh, the exercises that she took us through on that day was very um, um, uh, useful to take back to staff so yeah. and get them to do that as a PD exercise would be fantastic actually yeah um, yeah because I, I, I've, I've struggled a bit in that respect trying to get the um, the pre-planning and the uh, risk assessments done prior to going away uh, you know it it's not that it isn't being done but you know it's it's a reluctant exercise should I say Mm. Trying, to, trying to turn around that that train of thought to mm. make it something positive with everybody is is quite hard. Yeah. Yeah. Me, that exercise yesterday was fantastic. Yeah. Oh, that's great, James. Yeah. And I think that highlights the you know the importance of of the process, understanding the process, uh, and 
otherwise, you know, the tick box exercise or the, um, the, the material that's already written out that uh, isn't even given a cursory glance um, doesn't, uh, doesn't cut the mustard. Right. Excellent. Well, if there's no other questions, um, we'll say ka kite and thank you very much for coming along. Um, and yeah, and please fire your questions off to that email address and I'll do my best um, to respond. Thank you very much, everybody. Oh, thank you, and hopefully I'll see you next month. <laughs>